Exploring the Mind, in partnership with the U of M Department of Psychology. Uh, well, thank you all for coming out tonight. It's kind of a dreary night, maybe appropriate for the topic. Um, and thanks, Thad, for the um, really warm introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about psychopathy today and some of our research towards the end, but kind of more generally about psychopathy. Um, some of this was inspired just by uh, what I've seen over the last couple of years in the community about interest in some of these topics. And um, sometimes I think some people in the field of psychopathy are a little reticent to share work with media and, and uh, more kind of community level talks because it can be misinterpreted. We'll talk uh, as I go through about myths having to do with psychopathy and sort of what I think the research does and doesn't tell us. Um, but thank you for coming. And there's some esteemed uh, uh, emeritus professors from my department, which is an honor to, to speak to, and some folks from my lab, which is always nice too. So, um, uh, in my lab, we're really interested in understanding um, development from really early childhood uh, into adolescence and early adulthood and kind of understanding why this cute little baby uh, ends up being this boy in jail. And he's obviously pretty sad that he's in jail. And there's probably other people that are sad because of what he's done to get himself in jail. Um, and, and broadly, we're interested in understanding how experiences like parenting and living in dangerous neighborhoods interact with genetic background to uh, potentially affect the brain uh, and increase risk for uh, bad behavior like antisocial behavior. Um, I'm not going to talk about um, our brain imaging work tonight um, and just focus really on our work um, having to do with um, kind of early roots of psychopathy. So first was just some definition. So what is antisocial behavior? I'll be referring to antisocial behavior throughout the night. It's a group of behaviors um, including physical and sexual aggression, uh, destruction of property, and theft and violation of serious rules. There's a manual that psychiatrists and clinical psychologists use for diagnoses. It's called the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, the DSM. It's currently version number five. Um, and these, these uh, types of behaviors are grouped as diagnosed as conduct disorder in children uh, and antisocial personality disorder uh, in adults. I'm going to show you the symptoms just so you have an idea of um, kind of the types of behaviors would, that would get a diagnosis for a kid. So the first one is uh, conduct disorder. As you might notice, there are a lot of symptoms. So there are 15 symptoms. Um, but they can kind of loosely be grouped into aggression to people and animals, so things like bullying people, initiating physical fights, um, harming animals on purpose, uh, destruction of property, uh, things like fire setting and vandalism. Um, deceitfulness or theft, so breaking into houses, um, stealing things of non-trivial value, and violation of serious rules, so um, staying out all night over and over uh, against parental wishes, um, running away overnight, or being truant starting early in life before age 13. Now one issue I'll come back to is that you actually only need three of these symptoms to get this diagnosis. So you can imagine the heterogeneity there is in kids who have a conduct disorder diagnosis. That is, you could be a kid who basically just won't follow what their par the parents are doing and skip school, or you could be a kid who's getting in fights constantly and torturing animals, right? So there are a, a vast array of different uh, types of kids and different types of behaviors that could go together. Uh, and so this is a diagnosis that we'd apply to any social behavior uh, up until age 18. Um, for antisocial personality disorder, you need to have, again, three symptoms of any of the ones up here. So failure to conform to social laws, so, so breaking, uh, breaking laws, deceitfulness, lying, using things like aliases and conning other people, um, being impulsive or failure to plan ahead, being irritable and aggressive, um, being reckless with uh, safety of others. So um, this would be like um, driving while intoxicated, speeding around, uh, doing that frequently, um, consistent irresponsibility, and lack of remorse. You notice that the criteria for adults aren't quite as specific or quite as concrete as they are for, for children. Um, you also must have shown conduct disorder before age 15. So it, it's extremely rare to see adults have, having followed the rules their whole life and suddenly say, you know what, I'm going to start breaking all these rules and, and breaking laws. That typically doesn't happen. Um, and so uh, again, you'll have to have three, so there's some heterogeneity. And, and what you'll also notice that I'll come back to is that these behaviors are mostly observable things. So the DSM has focused for these two diagnoses on things that are very easily observable and thus don't have a lot to do with personality. So why should we care about um, antisocial behavior? There's a huge cost to society. So um, 
it might not seem that way, but kids getting involved in antisocial behavior is really terrible for their own life trajectory, right? Ending up in jail, failing school, um, getting into fights, these can all you know, increase their risk of death, not having jobs. So even just for the perpetrators, th these behaviors are bad. But then if you think about the victims and the money we spend as a society uh, trying to treat, incarcerate um, kids or adults with these behaviors, it's huge. Um, so even outside of incarceration costs, um, there was a, a really good study done um, in this large um, multi-state um, treatment study, and they found that kids and adolescents with conduct disorder cost $14,000 more per year than other kids in the sample, even kids with other mental health conditions. So these are kids are really, really expensive. And so actually, as I'll, I'll talk about at the end, even mildly effective interventions are super cost effective if you can see the payoff 20 years down the line. Unfortunately for politicians, they're not usually thinking about 20 years down the line, but uh, preventing any social behavior is extremely cost effective. Because these costs also go across many different things. So they go to schools, juvenile justice, inpatient and residential treatments, outpatient mental health. So unlike other mental illnesses, a lot of these costs are borne on society, not necessarily just on, on um, the victims. But the lifetime of, uh, prevalence of conduct disorder is about 10% and up to 12% or even 15% among males and in urban environments. So, is actually a pretty large segment of uh, society. And any social behavior, especially if it persists after early childhood, can be relatively chronic in nature. And so again, we have a lot of motion, motivation to, tr to want to treat or, uh, or prevent these behaviors, and that'll kind of be a theme as I go. So now you have an idea about antisocial behavior broadly, uh, which is what we study in my lab and why it's important. But I know that you know, I teased you with this idea about talking about psychopathy, right? Which is probably the thing that maybe got you more interested in than just bad behavior. So, Question to you all. What do you think of when you think of psychopath? Yeah? Someone who feels no remorse for anything. Okay, someone who feels no remorse. Someone who feels no empathy. Okay, someone who feels no empathy. My old boss. Your old boss? Okay. <laughs> yeah. One who's so willing to lie to get their own ends. Okay, someone who's willing to lie. What other people think about the truth. Okay, so they're willing to manipulate or lie to other people, so they're deceitful. Other ideas? Yeah. Narcissistic. So they're narcissistic, uh, they're very caught up with themselves, uh, they care mostly about themselves. So there's a variety of images uh, in popular media. Though so there are images like the corporate psychopath, like Bernie Madoff. There are other ones like the con artist, um, if you've seen Catch Me If You Can, the movie that's about uh, Frank Abagnale, um, so kind of a con artist. Uh, there's a serial killer uh, or chronic offenders. And people have different prototypes in their mind about what they think about when they think of psychopath. And we'll talk about the ways in which some of these do and don't fit, and which aspects of this may fit the, the idea of psychopathy, um, but that uh, these don't always match in the same way that we might think. The other thing that I think is problematic is that we're pretty unlikely to interact with someone really high in psychopathy, or if we do, later we might think, wow, that person was a psychopath. Um, but we might not have a lot of insight as to whether that's actually true. And so our, whereas we might have friends or relatives or ourselves might go through something like depression, we don't see this in our regular life often. And so media ends up really shaping what we think about what psychopathy is. Um, and I would even say I belong to the uh, SSSP, which is a Society for Psychopathy. I think even at, at the highest levels of science, people studying psychopaths, it, it's still um, melded by um, media, which is sometimes accurate and sometimes not. So where do we get this term of psychopathy? The term actually dates back to the early 1800s, but it was used for all sorts of things, not including what we, uh, we call psychopathy now. The term was coined um, by a German psychiatrist in the early 1900s, but he even used it for, um, to, to label a, a wide array of psychiatric disorders. Sort of the first articulation that I think today still uh, influences the way we think about psychopathy was by a guy named Harvey Cleckley um, in 1941. There's a great book, actually a really interesting one, called The Mask of Sanity. If you're interested in reading it, you can actually find copies of it for free online. Um, it's basically case studies, so it's pretty interesting reading. And uh, he actually describes doctors, lawyers, professors. Um, uh, and so his uh, initial conceptualization of psychopathy is this mask of sanity. That is, these are people who generally look well. That is, as compared to people who was working with a psychiatric hospital who seem to be clearly suffering from psychosis or delusions or um, seem to be very depressed and suicidal, 
people he saw high in psychopathy seemed to generally seem to be functioning well. So they had positive adjustment, or at least looked like they did. So they were superficially charming. They seemed to be intelligent, but maybe not at a deep level. Um, they didn't have irrational thinking. They didn't seem nervous. And they almost never carried out suicide. So they seemed very different from other psychiatric patients he was seeing. But he also noted that they had these kind of deviant behaviors. So inadequately motivated behavior, that is breaking rules, and it didn't really make sense why they were doing that. Uh, poor judgment or failure to learn from experience, um, unreliability, sex life is impersonal, and failure to follow a life plan. That is kind of drifter, um, this kind of parasitic lifestyle. He also noted that these folks, besides having these kind of deviant behaviors, seem to have a different set, type of personality. So they seem to be untruthful, seem to lack remorse and empathy, as some of you pointed out. Um, they seem to be egocentric in sort of a narcissistic way, um, and to not have a lot of uh, insight into themselves, and to also have this kind of lack of um, interpersonal relationships or orientation towards other or caring about other people's feelings. And so this was kind of the start. The, the, the term psychopathy didn't have a good concrete uh, conceptualization for a long time. There were sort of various measures until um, the early 80s um, when Bob Hare uh, in Canada made the psychopathy checklist and then subsequently the psychopathy checklist revised. Um, now, there are existing probably at least five or six well-known measures of psychopathy. This is not the only one. People have raised issues with the idea that this has become, the construct shouldn't become the measure, but in fact, this is mostly how people define psychopathy. And so, in Bob Hare's work, he defined uh, psychopathy across um, 20 items that are rated on a zero, one, and two scale, with zero being not there, two being definitely there, and one being sort of there. Um, and they go across four facets, but really two scales. One is about antisocial behavior. So it has to do with a parasitic lifestyle, impulsivity, um, juvenile delinquency. So a lot of the antisocial behavior we talked about already. But he also um, articulated some of these interpersonal and affective deficits or personality uh, traits that seem to make psychopathy unique from something like antisocial personality disorder. So he noted that these folks were glib and superficially charm, charming. They were grandiose. Uh, pathologically lying, cunning, and manipulative. Um, sometimes these are people that you strike you as really likable at first. In fact, in my lab, sometimes when we do interviews, one of um, our lab managers will interview someone and say, I don't think they're that antisocial. They seem really nice. They were really charming. Mm -hmm. And we all sort of chuckle and say, superficially charming? Do they seem too nice? Um, and so, again, I'm not, I'm not encouraging you to think the, the people you know in your life who are really nice are psychopaths, but uh, there's this kind of superficial nature whereby at first they seem really engaging. Um, there's also affective, so shallow affect, meaning that they don't seem to, to um, experience uh, deep emotions, especially interpersonal ones like love and empathy, or might use their affect to manipulate other people. Um, they're callous and lack empathy. Um, and so this is the main way, oh wow, Siri thought I was talking to her. Okay, um, this is the main way that we measure psychopathy now. This is used in um, legal proceedings, it's used in evaluation uh, across many states, um, and it's, it's um, uh, greater on a scale up to 40. So because you can get two for, every, uh, for 20 items, you can get up to 40. The cutoff in the US is typically 30, so above 30 you qualify as a psychopath. Um, in Europe, sometimes it's lower. Um, but there's no scientific evidence that this is a tax on or a category. That is, there's no evidence that you are either psychopath or you are not. Everything we can see looks like this is a dimension. So if we scored everyone in the room, there might be some distribution, probably not a very high distribution. Um, most people get zeros for these, um, but it's uh, a distribution. So somebody getting a 29 is not qualitatively different than somebody getting a 31. I'll also point out, that the psychopathy checklist is not something that you just sit down with and you're like, hey, that guy seems glib. You interview the person, you fi do a file review of their forensic files so you can look at their crimes. Often you do that before you interview them so that you, you know what they did so that you can hear how they're going to tell you what they think they did. Um, and uh, you use that to, to rate this. So now we have an idea of what psychopathy is. I would sort of call it any social personality disorder plus this charming, lack of empathy, um, emotionally superficial uh, personality style. So what are the core deficits? That is what makes someone psychopathic. We don't know if we did, hopefully we'd be able to treat better. Um, but there are kind of, there are lots of uh, historical theories, but there are kind of two main theories right now in the field. One put forward by people like James Blair um, is that Fundamentally, people with psychopathy or people high on psychopathic traits um, 
lack an, emo an, an automatic emotional empathy response. That is, people high in psychopathy uh, struggle with identifying um, emotions in others. They don't seem to have the same kind of biological responses to distress in others. So there's classic studies where if you show people high in psychopathy gory images and you measure their skin conductance, which is like how much they're sweating, which is a measure of sort of how upset or how oriented they are, they show much less response than people without psychopathy. It seems to have a deficit, especially in other people's distress. And of course, if you think about this, growing up, if you aren't, you know, if you are three and you go and you punch somebody to get the toy they're playing with, and that kid's crying doesn't make you feel bad, you probably keep doing that, right? I mean, the reason a lot of us don't do this is because we feel bad when we do these things. Um, there's a kind of competing theory that's an intentional theory, which is the idea that actually people with psychopathy in the right circumstances do feel empathy and do notice other people's emotions, but that they have trouble either integrating this information or have a bottleneck in their attention, whereby when they get kind of locked into something they want, they miss all these other emotional cues. Um, so a sort of disturbing story in uh, one of the books I'll mention later is a, a guy talking about why he had um, murdered his girlfriend in a bathtub, and it was that she would slip in the bathtub and hurt herself, and she just kept screaming. And so he said, I just wanted her to stop screaming, so he killed her. So again, this is kind of this uh, doesn't make sense the motivations behind the behaviors, but again, maybe it's because he's locked into this idea that I need to get the screaming to stop without thinking about everything else that's happening. So those are competing theories. They might uh, probably both write in some ways. But generally, we know from now decades of research that people high in psychopathy seem to be relatively fearless. And there's theories about how that might be that they're kind of lacking inhibition systems. They're also reward dependent, meaning once they get going on a reward, they want to keep going after even if contingencies change. So that is, you know, they can steal something from here and it works one time. The next time, even if they get caught, they keep going back. Um, and so people have theorized about whether this is uh, an overactive approach system. We know generally that impulsivity is one of the main symptoms. That is, they're very impulsive, not thinking things through. And we know that in general, people high in psychopathy uh, lack emotion and uh, remorse about other people's suffering. Now, you might be saying, this is pretty complex. In some ways, this seems like it could meet lots of different people. I want to point out that there are some um, sort of um, contradictory parts to psychopathy. So for example, People high in psychopathy are likely to be high in pathological lying and being manipulative. That seems to take a lot of th forethought, right? To manipulate someone means kind of planning ahead, thinking through what you're going to do. And yet, a, a, another core feature is that they're impulsive um, and irresponsible. And so we think of this as a multi-dimensional construct. Not everyone will have all of them. But there are these, some of these contradictions that in, in certain circumstances, people high in psychopathy will do things that it seem very well thought out. But then in others, they'll be very impulsive. So that's kind of one of the mysteries of this disorder. Okay, so now hopefully you understand what psychopathy is and where we sort of think it come from. Um, and let me now address some myths about psychopathy. So the first is that psychopaths are serial killers and all serial killers are psychopaths. Not true. There are many examples of people who have been serial killers who would score very high in psychopathy, but there are also examples of people who have killed many people who are not. Uh, many of the mass murderers that we see now in terms of mass shootings probably would not score very high in psychopathy. And relatedly, a lot of people think psychopathy is synonymous with violence. If you look back to the symptoms, you can have a lot of these symptoms without being super violent. So there are plenty of people high in psychopathy who are mostly drifting around, conning people, maybe occasionally getting into fights, but aren't necessarily doing huge violent crime. On average, people high in psychopathy do commit a disproportionate amount of the violent crime in the country, but that doesn't mean that, that most people high in psychopathy are necessarily mostly doing um, uh, crime. Some people think that psychopathy has to do with psychosis. If you watch uh, portrayals like the Joker uh, in the Batman series, it kind of portrays this very you know, crazy and psychotic person. In fact, Cleckley's definition was this person does not seem to have psychosis. So we generally see that people high in psychopathy tend to not have a lot of other mental health disorders, although they do like to use substances. Other people will think that it's related to split personality. There's a whole other talk to be given on split personality, uh, but uh, there's no relationship uh, between what's now called the identi de disassociative identity disorder and uh, psychopathy. And then another one is that people often confuse antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy. There's been some movement in the field to change the definition of antisocial personality disorder to be more like psychopathy, because actually there's a ton more research on psychopathy than there is on antisocial personality disorder, um, because antisocial personality disorder mostly captures any social behavior, and so it's not a particularly unique um, psychiatric disorder. But as we've talked about, psychopathy is really 
that antisocial behavior plus these negative personality characteristics. People often ask me about sociopathy, um, and I, I can't give you a definitive account on this, but my understanding is that sociopathy is a term that came out uh, in the middle of the century, uh, particularly from people like sociologists who wanted to make sure it was emphasized that psychopathy didn't necessarily just come from biological origins, but might be created by society. Um, it generally seems to refer to the same thing. Uh, I use the term psychopathy because it's really well defined. We have good measures of it. Um, and so they're probably relatively interchangeable, although I've seen other experts in the field say that they, these are slightly different constructs. Another idea is this idea of the bad seed. That is, people with psychopathy were born bad. They've always been bad. There's something qualitatively different about them. That's what the rest of the talk will talk about, so I won't even address this one, and you can make up your own mind um, at the end. Another one is that treatment doesn't work, or that treatment makes people high in psychopathy better. So there's two ones. First is that treatment doesn't work. Here's what we know. We don't know of any empirically supported treatments for psychopathy. We also don't have any evidence that treatments don't work for them. The problem is, what's the treatment for most people high in psychopathy? It's incarceration. Incarceration is not a particularly effective treatment for anyone. So I, I can't tell you whether a treatment is, is or is not. There's a myth in the field that it's ineffective. There have been some good reviews showing that there aren't really any good trials showing whether, it's effective, whether treatment is, is or is not effective. Um, often people uh, have learned about psychopathy from The Sopranos. How many of you have seen The Sopranos? So a lot of people like to bring up the quote uh, that so the psychiatrist Dr. Melfi talks about um, when she's worried that Tony Soprano is a psychopath. And she says there are studies showing that therapy actually makes psychopaths worse. There is a study that says that. In that study, the treatment was giving um, people incarcerated and high in psychopathy LSD and doing naked encounter groups. <laughs> I'm not sure that is very close to the kind of treatments we'd offer today. And probably giving people high in psychopathy drugs would be something that can make them worse. So um, I wouldn't take a lot of stock in that study. And again, from the good reviews of Decent Science, we just really don't have good studies of this. So we don't know. Um, We'll talk about this more in childhood uh, and adolescence where there's a little bit more data, but we just really don't know whether treatment could work. I would expect it would be difficult, but I also think that actually these traits themselves can change um, in the right context. Okay, the final myth that's been increasing recently is the idea that you can diagnose yourself or other people by taking quizzes on the internet or on Facebook. <laughs> these have been going on a lot. In fact, there was a... Um, a uh, popular press book that came out, and actually the, this guy called The Psychopath Test, and this guy interviewed a bunch of people and misquoted them. Um, basically talking about the, the PCLR and saying that, you know, he would be a psychopath without really having any expertise about how you diagnose it. Uh, I would also say that just because I've shown you the items to that test, um, I would not use that to try to diagnose other people. Um, I'm not even trained well enough in the PCLR that I would trust my, my own um, ratings of it. And you really need a lot of experience. Uh, we do a lot more of this with, with adolescents in our lab, and I think my RAs can, can say that once you've heard the extremes of some of the symptoms, you start seeing that the things that you think are minor symptoms aren't really symptoms at all. Um, and so once you've seen kind of the prototype, you understand how far you are away from, um, from it with other more minor symptoms. So don't go on the internet and take psychopathy tests, or if you do, take them because they're funny. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to move to, uh, to childhood, but if you're interested to learning more about psychopathy, I think by far the best resource uh, is this article, and in fact, a lot of the points I took so far came from this article. Uh, Jennifer Skeen was the one that wrote this along with a bunch of other um, uh, big people in the field. It goes through myths about psychopathy, what we know in a very even way that's not particularly influenced by any one, one person's um, uh, goals in it, and so I would highly recommend that. And it's actually pretty easy to read. We read it in my undergrad class. If you're interested in something that's a little more fun to read or more popular press, uh, I'd recommend the, the Psychopath Whisper. Um, I was a little I was a little worried about it from the title, um, but actually it's a pretty good book. Um, it's a really good one if you want to um, learn more about examples. So the guy Kent Keel who, who um, wrote it worked with Bob Hare and has been in a lot of prisons and done a lot of interviews and PCLs with people high in psychopathy. And so he has a lot of stories that help illustrate um, the symptoms. Uh, he does mostly stick really well to the science of the field. He features his own science, not surprisingly, pretty well. So you might. And, and convinced that what he's done is the end all, um, but he's done a lot of the uh, major work in the field. All right, so what about does psychopathy exist in youth? 
So by definition, the PCL can only be measured uh, in adults. There is a youth version of it, and we'll talk about whether what that means. So in general, one of our goals is to try to treat any social behavior early, right? So we like to identify kids who are going to need the treatment as soon as we can. Or faced with this dichotomy, we know that almost all chronic life course offenders, so if you go you know, into prisons and you look at 20 and 30 year olds, people who have been doing a lot of bad things for a long time, we know pretty much all of them started very early in life, like as early as age two or three with any social behavior. But the problem is most early behavior problems resolve themselves naturally. So that is we're in a field with a lot of desistance. That is, uh, in toddlerhood and preschool, there's a lot of aggression, and I'll come back to that. But a lot of kids get better. Then in adolescence, again, there's a lot of antisocial behavior, but a lot of kids get better. And so part of what we have, are trying to do when we study antisocial behavior is identify who's not going to get better, who's not going to desist, because that's who we really want to treat. The other issue is that, which I've already alluded to, is that those engaging in antisocial behavior are really heterogeneous group. So first we said, you know, at least in kids, you only need three of 15 items for conduct disorder. Just based on what you've done, there are so many different permutations of what, who would qualify for conduct disorder. We also know that the reasons people engage in antisocial behavior are really different from uh, a kid who's living in a you know, upper class family and has everything they need, but is doing this because it's a thrill, to kids who might have nothing and might be doing it because it's a good way to earn income. <coughs> We also know that there are different courses depending on when antisocial behavior starts. So one of the first ways that people in the field have tried to look for more, uh, for less heterogeneity or find subgroups has been looking at the age of onset. And this has actually been in the DSM as part of the disorder, the uh, diagnosis of conic disorder for uh, a couple editions. And the theory is, which is supported by a lot of empirical work, is that there's a small group, about 5% of youth, mostly boys, who start their antisocial behavior really early, before age 10, and they persist across. Uh, and in fact, they get worse as they go. But then there's a larger group of teenagers who start transiently engaging in antisocial behavior. There may be many people in the room who got into trouble in adolescence because you know, it seemed fun or, or their friends were doing it, but then desist away. And so, People have been mostly interested in these early life course persistent. I will tell you that actually this is called adolescent limited, but there's some really good follow-up data on huge cohorts. And the kids that engage in adolescence, some of them actually do poorly in adulthood. So it's not something we should be like, yeah, my kid's beating up kids when they're 15. That'll go away. Um, th there are lifelong consequences. And in fact, part of this theory is that one of the dangers with this adolescence behavior is that um, uh, it can get kids trapped in snares. Um, that is, maybe they're doing this transiently, you know, breaking into an abandoned house because it's fun with their friends, and they're going to desist, but if they get caught and get in trouble, then that may actually put them in a new environment. And of course, these kind of snares are not randomly distributed pop across the population, but are more likely to happen to low-income youth, boys of color, and so that can ensnare kids that otherwise may have desisted on their own. So that's one major theory and one way we think about making a more homogenous course. The other is by measuring something called callous unemotional traits. So in the early 1990s, this guy up here, Paul Frick, um, worked with Bob Hare um, to extend the concept of adult psychopathy to children. And he wanted to measure, essentially, the developmentally appropriate aspects of psychopathy earlier on. And they found three different scales, uh, callous unemotional traits, a narcissistic scale, and impulsive characteristics. For some reason, the callousness seemed to predict a lot more, and so that part really caught on. People sort of left the narcissism and the impulsivity um, in the wayside. But callous emotional traits is defined by low empathy, callousness towards other, and being unemotional or using emotions to manipulate others. You'll recognize those symptoms from the PCLR. And it was actually added recently to the DSM as something called limited prosocial emotions. They were worried callous and emotional would be um, stigmatizing, which I agree with. However, if you Google limited prosocial emotions, the first thing that comes up is callous and emotional. Um, and these are four symptoms. So lack of remorse or guilt, callous, lack of empathy, unconcerned about performance, um, like in school and other areas, and shallow or deficient affect. And so now kids can be diagnosed with conduct disorder plus limited prosocial emotions. You have to have two of those four. Um, to qualify. So the first thing I want to establish is, do CU traits mean juvenile psychopathy? Well, let's remind ourselves of, um, of the symptoms. So there's this first factor with interpersonal and affective, and then a second factor. So maybe the second factor is conduct disorder. Maybe it's that antisocial behavior. 
If we look at limited prosocial emotions, we see that it does match some of these affective deficits, but not all of them, partly because some of them aren't developmentally appropriate. So um, grandiose sense of self-worth, how many of you know adolescents? They're pretty high in that. Um, uh, failure to expect, accept responsibility. I have a two and a half year old and she doesn't ever accept responsibility. So some of these are difficult to apply to younger populations, but I wanna highlight that this is tapping some of the traits of psychopathy, not all of it, for sure. Um, and there are measures that tap other parts of it, but we're really just tapping some of it. So we think of this as a downward extension of these components. And I would call it a risk factor for psychopathy, but not psychopathy. And let me be clear about what a risk factor means. So I would um, give the comparison to high blood pressure, because we all understand that as a risk factor, right? If you have high blood pressure, are you gonna have a heart attack right now? Probably not, right? It's very unlikely. But if you have high blood pressure, should you probably treat it to decrease your risk of a heart attack? Yes. So the same thing here. We are not studying child psychopaths. We are studying traits that look like they could become psychopathy later, and then in a lot of kids may go away, but these might be kids we'd want to intervene with because these are still troubling signs early on. We know that callous and emotional traits predict more severe antisocial behavior. They predict more stable antisocial behavior, so they do predict who's less likely to desist, and they predict more of proactive aggression. And what that is is most aggression that kids have is reactive. That is, a kid pushes them, they get upset, and they hit the kid. Very few kids will do proactive aggression when they use aggression to get something or they think through what they're gonna do, so threatening kids, um, beating them up to make them scared of you. Uh, and proactive aggression is pretty rare, but you see it mostly in kids with callous and emotional traits and rarely in kids without, any, so without callous and emotional traits. We also think callous and emotional traits may be um, helping us identify a very unique subgroup that has sort of a different etiology or different causes to the behavior. So in studies that usually compare kids with antisocial behavior without callous and emotional traits to kids with antisocial behavior and callous and emotional traits, we find that the kids without, with callous and emotional traits have difficulty processing punishment cues. So punishment doesn't seem to work as well. Um, you can give them tasks where um, they're choosing uh, three different doors and one door has big rewards and then it changes and they're mostly getting punished. They'll just keep going after that door and going after the reward and ignore the punishment cue. So that's kind of this re reward responsivity. They seem to be impaired in their responsiveness to and recognition of emotions in others, especially fear and sadness. So they'll have trouble recognizing um, faces that are morphing um, between different types of emotions. Um, another scholar in the field, Essie Veeding, um, who's in London, uh, likes to tell the story that when she was uh, um, interviewing adult psychopaths and doing this test where they were showing different kinds of faces and asking what emotion, uh, she showed a guy very high in psychopathy, a fear face. She said, what emotion is this? And he said, I don't know what the name of that emotion is, but I think it's the face that I get before I stab people. So this is the idea, and of course this is an extreme case, but it's the idea that we're having trouble recognizing these fearful faces, and fearful face with this directed eye gaze you should rarely see in your life because you shouldn't often be doing something that someone is that terrified for, but you'd recognize it quickly. We also know that kids with CU traits um, show lower fear and anxiety, and that may again help make it easier to engage in antisocial behavior. We also think the causes might be different. Uh, it's a term we use called etiology. So the first is that people have used twin studies to study heritability. That is essentially how genetic is this? And what they find is, if you look to the far right, you see at age seven and age nine, these are twins that uh, are high in antisocial behavior but low on callousness. And the black, the black part of that line is A, which is the genetic component. And you can see about a third of the, the variability between people seems to be genetic, but the other two have to do with the environment, and so there's a lot of environmental contribution. If you look over to the kids high in antisocial behavior and high in callous and emotional traits, you'll see mostly black there. That is, it implies that a lot of the variation between people seems to be due to heritable or genetic influences. So they found heritability as high as 80%. That's about as high as you're ever gonna see it for psychiatric disorder. There have been, this was one of the first studies. There have been studies since, it's probably lower than that. But this idea is that maybe antisocial behavior in the presence of callous and emotional traits is much more genetic, whereas most antisocial behavior we think is a little genetic, like if you have antisocial uh, uh, relatives, you're more likely to have it, but there are a lot of social causes too. And we'll come back to this uh, in a minute. There's also been some um, really interesting uh, brain imaging work. Um, so looking at the amygdala, which is a, a, a part of your brain that helps you orient to threat or to what's important. So like if there was a snake over there and I said, there's a snake, your amygdala would be the one telling you like, you should be scared of this, this is something we care about. And um, if you show 
typical, if you look in the middle, that middle bar is, is kids without any social behavior. They show this kind of in-between response where if they see fearful faces, um, they have a response to the amygdala, but it's not pronounced. If you show kids with any social behavior that don't have callous emotional states, they actually show an exaggerated response. They show this bigger response, which is consistent with the idea that most kids that engage in any social behavior and aggression are actually emotionally dysregulated. They have trouble controlling their emotions. But what's interesting is that far right bar, the kids who have callous and emotional traits and any social behavior should almost show the lowest response. That is, they're seeing these faces, and their amygdala is not telling them this is kind of an important or affectively uh, relevant cue. And it's interesting because, again, the, the left and the right bars, those are kids that otherwise might look similar. They both might be engaging in high levels of aggression and antisocial behavior, and let their brain response to the stimuli is, is, uh, is quite divergent. But let me give you a caveat, because um, these studies, while I think they're really helpful in terms of helping us understand the different etiologies, can be interpreted very poorly. So first, what does heritability mean? Heritability is essentially how much of variation between people has to do with genetic or um, environmental things. It has to do most, mostly with how similar identical twins are versus uh, fraternal twins. But it's specific to a time and a context, and it's explaining why different people vary from each other. So IQ is a really good example. IQ has been found for a long time to be highly heritable. But when people finally did uh, research on IQ in lower income uh, kids, they found it was not very heritable at all. That is, when there's a really good environment, the variation between people has a lot to do with their genetics. But as soon as the environment's not as good, genetics don't matter as much. So you have to be very specific. In the twin studies, these are normative samples, pretty good environments. You might see more uh, genetic expression. The other thing is just because something is heritable doesn't mean the environment doesn't matter. Height, we all know height is highly heritable, right? The reason I'm tall, you could probably guess my parents were tall, right? My wife and I are tall, you can guess my children are very tall. However, the reason that I'm taller than say my grandparents or than their grandparents is increased nutrition, all kinds of environmental factors. So again, if we took children that had tall parents and didn't feed them well, they wouldn't be as tall. Right? So again, just because something is heritable doesn't mean the environment can't be important. The other thing I want to say is, even though I'm a neuroscientist, we do a lot of studies uh, with the brain, we want to be careful what we think it means when we see differences in the brain. The brain is changing constantly. If you remember anything from tonight, your brain changed. That's how your brain remembers things. So your brain is always changing, and so just because we see different responses in the brain doesn't mean that this was inborn, that it, kid, this is a bad seed, this kid came from birth. It also doesn't mean it's more static. We know that brain responses can change. So for example, um, when people have depression and they get treated with cognitive behavioral therapy, their brain changes just as much as when they get medication. So experiences change our brain all the time. It also doesn't mean it's the core cause. It could be that these kids don't look at other people's faces as much, and so their brain doesn't have a lot of experience, and so that's why it doesn't react as much to that, but it doesn't mean it's the brain is the, what's causing it. It could have to do with other things. Okay. The other thing I want to, other caveat I want to give about CU traits is the idea that it's a trait, meaning it's stable. That may be true for some kids. So this was a study done in a, a large sample of normative adolescents. And you can see, first of all, our normative children from age 7 to 12. The blue line at the bottom is most kids. That is, most kids are low on callous and emotional traits. They stay stably low. Great. That's good for society. That upper red line is kids high in callous emotional traits. It looks very stable, right? The kids who start with it at age seven, there's a large group that go. However, that group, you might not be able to see it, is only 3% of the population. The blue group is 70%. Now, that yellow group looked high. If you'd only measured them at seven, you would have thought, this kid is callous and emotional. But if you measured them at 12, you would have said, no, they're not. And in fact, that's 16% of the sample. And the green one looks like these kids look fine. They're not callous. But then by 12, uh-oh, these kids are callous. That's 9%. So there's far more change in the population than there is high stability. So that is, there are some kids this is going to be high stable, but that doesn't mean for all of them. So can CU traits be treated? So traits, as I said, doesn't mean immutable, stable, or untreated. And in fact, even in the field, in the research field, there's a big belief that CU traits can't be treated. But most people like to cite some early studies um, that didn't use a control group. Um, and they found that CU traits were a good predictor of treatment outcome. So let's think about it this way. If you start worse, that is, we know kids with callous and emotional traits start worse, they have more antisocial behavior, and you use that to predict how they're going to do at the end, even if they benefit, they're going to end worse, right? Because they started worse even if they benefit some, and I'll show you guys this graphically. 
So a lot of these studies didn't have a control group, and I'll show you why a randomized controlled trial is the best uh, way of looking at um, whether treatment works. So, so let's say that this is our hypothetical graph. We have a treatment, everyone receives the treatment. In blue are the kids that are low on callous emotional traits, and they benefit a lot, right? They go from being pretty antisocial to pretty not antisocial. And the kids high on callous emotional traits, they were even higher, and they came down some. You would conclude from this that the treatment is not as effective for those kids high on callous emotional traits. Right? Everyone agrees that's what it looks like? But what's happening naturalistically to kids who aren't getting treatment? Well, kids with low CU traits, we know any social behavior sometimes resolves on its own. So maybe those kids are actually getting better on their own without treatment. And we know maybe CU traits predicts more stability to any social behavior, so those kids are staying about the same. Seems right? We put those together, it looks like the treatment is about equally effective for everyone, right? Everyone's gotten about the same from what they would have done had they not been in the, in the treatment trial. And that's what we think is happening in a lot of these trials. So it's not that CU traits can't be treated, it's that we need to, to make uh, treatments that are extra effective for them. Because to normalize their behavior will actually take a really, really effective treatment. And so we've done reviews in my lab looking to see whether treatment work, and we found that it does. So we have uh, one looking at parenting interventions, uh, a postdoc in my lab, Becky Waller, did one looking at youth-focused interventions, and both concluded that using a systematic review of the evidence, there is evidence that treatments work, um, especially well-controlled trials. Now again, that doesn't mean we don't need to make our treatments better. I wouldn't be happy if my kid had callous emotional traits and I brought them in and they said, well, we'll get them a little bit better, but they'll still have a lot of antisocial behavior. So we still need to get better, but in general, treatments do work. There's also some really cool work um, at Mendota Mental Health, actually changing psychopathy scores. So that this is a, um, a essentially a, a jail or residential treatment facility, and it's it's pretty cool. They uh, this is in Madison, Wisconsin. They took uh, one wing of the residential treatment facility, and instead of just locking the kids up, they said, "Why don't we use psychology to to do what we know might work for treatment?" So they actually give kids rewards for good behavior. Um, they establish good relationships with them, and lo and behold. When they do this, kids' psychopathy scores actually change, and they have a, a fair amount of success. Now, it's not a panacea. Um, it goes from something like uh, of the kids who are not in the, the treatment group, those kids that stay in the jail, and when they get released, they have like a 80 or 90% recidivism rate, meaning most of them end up uh, getting arrested again. But the kids in the treatment group go down to about 50%. 50% is still not awesome, but it's a, it's a lot better than 80 or 90%. So we think uh, that we can do this. So that's what we know about CU traits in childhood. And really, most of this work has been done on teenagers and kids as low as maybe six or seven. And so when I started studying this, I thought, you know, what do we know about this earlier in life when we might be able to have a better chance at intervening? That is, if we get kids younger, could that matter? So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done um, with younger kids. So a really key developmental period for the development of antisocial behavior is the toddler and preschool period. Um, it's a, a, a really big, important time. There's new physical mobility in the toddler period. They don't have a lot of emotion regulation or appreciate the consequences of what they're doing. It's a peak period of neural change. This is a lot like adolescence. Um, and it's a big press for parents. I have a two and a half year old, and I can tell you it depresses me every day. I love my daughter, but she likes throwing temper tantrums. I was gonna do a picture of her, but I couldn't get her to sit still, and she didn't like it when I took pictures of her while she was having a temper tantrum. Um, this is also the peak for aggression. Uh, in, in humans is during two or three. So um, the other day, uh, my daughter hit her grandma, who's here uh, helping out right now, and then laughed about it. So it seems really troubling, like a psychopath, but we'd also want to think about what do other kids do at this age, and in fact, behaviors like that are, are very normative, or so I hope. Um, uh, we do know that when antisocial behavior starts at this age, and a lot of kids are doing these kind of aggressive behaviors, and so we're trying to socialize them out of it, we know that if it does, they don't get socialized out of it, it may get entrenched. And there's a lot of really good work on something called coercive cycles. So this guy, Jerry Patterson, um, who's at the University of Oregon, did a lot of work on this. Um, and he essentially noticed from working with parents and kids that there was this cycle that happened when kids had behavior problems. Parents would give a request, the child might refuse, the parent might escalate and say, no, you have to do this. The kid would escalate and start freaking out, and the parent would either escalate more or withdraw. So think of yourself uh, at the grocery store with a hungry three-year-old, and they say, I want candy right now. What do you say? No, we're not having candy. What does a child do? They start crying and screaming. You start looking around and feeling embarrassed. Uh, you say, no, you can't have that, and you raise your voice, and then maybe you give in because everyone's watching you. What does the kid learn from that? They've learned that 
throwing a temper tantrum is pretty effective. Um, and so he noticed that over time what happens is that if you have a more difficult kid, it makes it harder to parent. The parents tend to get more harsh over time because they're frustrated and angry. The kid has learned that the more I escalate, the more likely I am to get my parent to give up and get what I want. And the parents learned, you know what? I get the, kid, the kids stop screaming when I withdraw and give up. So they're also being rewarded essentially for giving up. And that happens, and occasionally the parent gets really mad. They might yell. They might hit uh, because they're sick of the cycle. And so we know that that cycle can uh, exacerbate itself over time and over the years. So let's return back to this idea about early identification, that we know that these early life course offenders start really early in life. And so we're trying to identify who won't desist. And so even though CU traits might be useful in later childhood, we really want to know who's going to desist at age two or three, because maybe we could intervene then, help parents support them through this transition, and help decrease this before. Because if you see them by seven or eight, there's a lot, a lot of course of cycles. It's a lot of learning you're trying to intervene with. Whereas at two or three, there's not as much. And so our first question was, can we even measure something like CU traits? No one had really used that. The measure I think people were afraid to because they were worried about people saying you're studying psychopaths in preschool. And so um, we used a study called the Early Steps Multi-Site Study. It's a preventative intervention. Uh, it's with mostly low-income families. They had, had to have uh, multiple ris risks. They were uh, recruited from women infant children programs. So those are nutritional supplement for lower income families. And they had to have multiple risk criteria, like um, having family problems, like a parent who was depressed or using substances, or early child behavior problems. It was a diverse sample and across um, urban, uh, rural, and suburban contexts. As you can see, a pretty poor family. So two thirds of the families had an annual income less than 20,000. And they had kids, right? So you can think about that this was a fairly impoverished sample. Um, and they've been followed since the kids were age two, and they're now actually in their teenage years, but I'm going to talk about data up to when they were nine and a half. And so since there was no measure of CU traits, we tried to identify items that looked like CU traits, or what we call CU behaviors, to make it very clear we are not studying psychopathy in really young kids. And I want to be clear that we think of CU behaviors as a risk factor for CU traits, which is in turn a risk factor for psychopathy. So I think we're really not even touching on psychopathy. So maybe I sort of lied in the title to get you here. You can attribute that to whatever traits you want in me. Um, but we're really trying to study um, early risk factors, that is early behaviors that might make us think this kid could use intervention. And so those items like doesn't seem guilty, selfish or won't chair, sneaky or tries, and lies. So these should seem, you know, hopefully you agree that these seem like some of the things we're trying to study later. So our first question was, well, did, what we, did those items that we identified, would they measure worse antisocial behavior? And we found that from age two to four, they predicted worse behavior problems. And this was true whether we were predicting from age two to three, or three to four, or two to four, whether we were using mom's report, or dad or grandma's report, and whether we were using different measures. And this was above the stability of antisocial behavior behavior problems. So even if we controlled for earlier behavior problems, we saw the same. And I think to illustrate this, um, we did something called a latent growth curve where we look at kids' trajectories over time. Most kids are in that red bar, so from age two to four, their problem behavior is staying about the same or getting a little bit better. And there's a lot of variability in that group. So if I, if I put the lines for every kid, you'd see you know, a lot of change there. Some will start higher, some start lower, some increasing, some decreasing. The kids in blue were the kids high on CU behaviors. And in fact, they're increasing over time. And what's interesting is statistically, there's not a lot of variation in the course. Most kids are increasing, and they're increasing at that same rate. So it's not good for those kids, but good from a research perspective, because we've identified a more homogenous group. That is, we're identifying the kids who are getting worse and seem to be the most similar to each other. We also then looked as the kids got older. We had to, I had to wait around for a couple of years because the kids weren't that old at first. Um, when they were nine and a half, we convinced the study to add a measure of callous and emotional traits. And we found that it did predict a traditional measure of callous and emotional traits and worse behavior at nine and a half. Don't worry about this figure, but this is to say we use a kind of cool thing called a multi-trait, multi-method approach, uh, which is actually a really old approach, which you can do now with some cool statistics. And so we use different reporters. We used a mom and either a dad or a grandma, another person, and we could kind of pull apart their biases. We were worried maybe parents just think something's wrong with my kid and that predicts bad things. And so we were kind of able to pull out their biases and just look at the true trait that they agree on and found that by age three, that predicts even teacher reports of callous and emotional traits and behavior problems at age nine and a half. So what we created does seem to measure what we think, and again, risk factor for CU traits. The other thing we wanted to know is, what, is whether the correlates of CU behaviors were the same as we'd expect, and this is called a nomological network. 
That is, do skewed behaviors correlate with things that we think they should, like problems with morality, low empathy, and not correlate with things that they shouldn't? And so uh, we divided up items um, into three different categories for early behavior problems. Some kids were high in this oppositional behavior, and we expected them to have more anger and irritability. Some kids we thought would be higher on uh, ADHD, so they might have trouble with impulsivity and attention. And then we also expected that kids with callous and emotional behaviors should have conscious deficits and proactive aggression. And luckily for us, uh, at the same time we were doing this work, uh, a guy named Mike Willoughby and, and colleagues was developing a similar scale using uh, a measure that we have a lot of samples to basically divvy these items up into these three scales, which was really good because then we've now used this, these scales in, in uh, probably seven or eight different studies, samples. And so we asked ourselves, using data from the Michigan Longitudinal Study, and this is a, a study by Sherry Olson, who's in the psychology department here at UM. Um, this was Ann Arbor families, but with an oversample for kids with behavior problems. So it was mostly uh, more well-off, mostly uh, white sample, but with uh, increased amount of kids with behavior problems. We asked, would these three different dimensions have different correlates? And we have found that oppositional behavior was uniquely related to anger and frustration. Makes sense. ADHD was related to lower attention focus. And CU behavior was uniquely related to lower guilt, more regulation, and low empathy. And this was at age three and a half. And with some really cool uh, measures, observational measures uh, of these constructs. And then at age three and a half, that CU behavior predicted more proactive aggression from teacher reports at age six. And uniquely above these other ones. So again, of these three dimensions, this was the worst in terms of predicting, well, it, was, it predicted the outcomes well, but was the worst in terms of a precursor for kids. We also asked ourselves, are these kids harder to treat? The, the um, issue I brought up earlier, but in early childhood, and if you remember the early steps study that we started this in was an intervention study. And in that study, they found that the intervention group predicted changes in parenting. It's a parenting-focused fo intervention, so that's good. So they made parents more positive. And the more parents became positive, the more kids got better. We found that being high in CU behaviors did not change this relationship. That is, it wasn't harder for parents to become more positive if they're if their kids had callous and emotional behaviors, and the parenting made just as good an effect on their problem behavior. So in other words, this was equally effective for these kids, again, probably because we had a control group. So just to summarize, what we learned so far is that um, CU behaviors predict later CU traits. It seems to predict this more homogenous group and more severe antisocial behavior. Has, it's, it seems to measure what we think it's supposed to be measuring, and it could be a good target for early intervention because it doesn't interfere with treatment. So then we asked, how do these develop? And a lot of this work was done by a really stellar postdoc in my lab, uh, Becky Waller, who's now faculty at um, the University of Pennsylvania. And we thought parenting would be important to look at because it's a well-established risk factor for any social behavior. Remember those coercive cycles we talked about? It's a major target for intervention, just like the intervention I just told you. But people who study CU traits and psychopathy were really skeptical that parenting would matter. So we thought, well, let's first see if it's correlated. And we looked at measures of harsh parenting. Either we asked parents how harsh they were. Maybe not ideal, because most parents don't think they're that harsh. We also observed them. We had the kids play when they were age two and three with really cool toys. And then we asked them, have your kid clean up these toys, but don't help them. If you've had a two and three year old, you know that's not the most fun thing to do. Um, so we coded how positive or negative parents were. We also had them do teaching tasks where they had to do a, a, a game with the kids that was a little above what the kids could do. And we just watched them during a meal time. And so we coded these videos and coded how much harsh parenting and how much uh, warm parenting there was. We found that, yes, harsh parenting um, predicted CU behaviors one year later from age two to three and three to four. But we were really particularly interested in warmth because we know harshness is bad for any social behavior. We thought these kids would be, could be harder to parent. We think that the attachment to the parent is really important and that being warm or not being warm might be particularly important for CU behaviors. So we looked at this in the same sample. And so you can see here, we looked at parental warmth at age two predicting CU behavior at age three, but we also um, controlled for the overlap. And we found that yes, parental warmth at age two does predict um, callous and emotional behavior at age three. So if the parents were less warm, they had more callous and emotional behaviors. But we found that callous and emotional behavior at age two also predicted parenting at age three. Not surprising, if your kid seems callous to you, it's going to be a little bit harder to feel warm about them, right? If they're doing things and they don't feel guilty, it might be harder for you to continue to be warm year after year. 
we did a systematic review where we looked at all the studies back in 2013, and we found at least 10 studies across age periods showing that CU traits or behaviors were predicted by um, parenting. Most of them looked at harshness, but there were some really interesting studies that seemed that, to suggest that warmth might be the most important. But people didn't believe us. They said, well, First of all, you showed evocative effects. That is, maybe these kids are just evoking harsher parenting and less warmth. Maybe it's really the kid. This kid's a bad seed. They make it harder to parent. So it's not really the parenting. That parenting is an epiphenomenon. They also said, remember, this is really heritable. And they hadn't, hadn't read the books on heritability to remember that the environment can still matter even when it's heritable. They said, so maybe you're just, messing, uh, you're just measuring a genetic factor. And they say, is it possible that parenting doesn't cause the development or change in CU traits? via something called gene environment correlation. And there's two kinds of this. One is called passive gene environment correlation. And so what could happen is that parents who have callous and emotional genes are less warm because they're callous and emotional, and they pass those on to the kids. So they look, it looks like the parenting is causing it, but it's really just that they both have these genes that make them callous and emotional. So if you're nodding, so you're like, yeah, that actually is what I was thinking too. There's also evocative gene environment correlation. So parents pass on these genes, the kids are more are, are more difficult to parent. They evoke harsher parenting and low, lower warmth. And so again, it's the kids' genes that are actually causing this, and it's really a genetic effect. So that's a pretty big problem, one that we can't deal with with our, our past studies. It really could be that these are just genetic effects. So how do you solve that problem? Well, you use adopted kids. It's a natural experiment where you can pull apart the contribution of biological parents from uh, parents who are not biological. So we use, collaborate with the Early Growth and Development Study, which is led by Leslie Levin, and Janine Niederheiser at Oregon and uh, Penn State. And it's a really cool sample of over 500 adoptive children um, and their adoptive parents. And what's cool about this is that most of the kids, they're from all over the country, most of them were adopted within two days of birth. So they've had very little exposure to their birth parents. They obviously had in utero exposure, but for the most part, what we can think is that if we see correlations between the birth parent traits and the kid, those are genetic effects, right? Because the birth parent wasn't around for much. If we see that the parents, the adoptive parents, has a correlation, that looks like a true kind of non-heritable uh, environmental parenting effect. If we see an interaction, we call it a gene-environment interaction. And so we asked whether we could see these. So first we looked at birth mother's severe antisocial behavior. And we found that birth mother severe antisocial behavior did predict CU traits, or CU behaviors, uh, at 27 months old, so pretty young kids. So even though these birth moms have basically never seen these kids, there clearly is a genetic component, right? Something about the parents is being passed on to make their kids more likely to be callous. But we also saw that if the adoptive mother in our, in our, in our um, observation task um, during the cleanup used more positive reinforcement, that predicted less CU behavior. So awesome, it looks like parenting might really be a true effect, not just this genetic effect. We also saw this gene-environment interaction. What it is is that if these kids had parents who were not very warm, there's this positive correlation between the biological mother's, biological mother's antisocial behavior and CU, CU behaviors. That is, if your parent wasn't warm, the genetic thing is unfolding. But if your parent was really warm, they basically knock out that genetic effect. This is really important for interventions because it means that even for a kid who's at risk genetically, if we can get parents to be warmer, we can get rid of that effect. That is, we can protect these kids from having, showing these um, difficult traits. Now, adoption can't actually eliminate evocative uh, gene environment correlation because the kids could still evoke harsher parenting from their adoptive parent even though it's genetic. So we wanted to turn to uh, another uh, genetically informed design. And so we collaborated with Alex Burt at Michigan State uh, who has a huge twin sample. And what we can do is examine differences between monozygotic or identical twins. And they have the exact same DNA. And so if they had different experiences, like they were parented a little bit differently, and those differences correlate with their behaviors, we know it can't be genetic because they have the same DNA. That makes sense? And believe it or not, parents actually do parent their identical, uh, identical children differently. They're not huge effects, but there are small differences. So we used the Michigan State Twin Registry, uh, which is now a sample that we've uh, been working with a little more closely with brain imaging, uh, and identified 227 identical twin pairs from age 6 to 10. Again, this is uh, research uh, led by Becky Waller. We found that differences in harshness uh, and parental harshness with their twins predicted differences in aggression and differences in CU traits. So in other words, the, if there were differences between the way the parent did, the harsher kid the kid who got harsher parenting ended up having more aggression and more CU traits, or CU behaviors. 
but you, differences in warmth were uniquely related to CU traits. So in other words, this is more evidence that parenting is a non-genetic, non-heritable contextual factor for CU uh, traits. And in fact, warmth may be particularly unique for CU traits. Another way you could do this, and another group has done uh, in Quebec, is to see whether parenting moderates the heritability, that is, makes it less genetic. And they found the same thing. So they found that um, warmer parenting decreased the heritability. So if you look at the left of that graph, that's the heritability is up around 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So a lot of the variance is accounted for by um, genetics. But as parents get warmer, as you go across there, the heritability comes down. That is essentially warmer parents are decreasing the amount of genetics plays in explaining um, callous emotional traits. And so we've wondered what's being passed on from birth parents. And so based on research on psychopathy, we theorize that fearlessness and low affiliation or low orientation towards others might be that. And so we measured that in the adoptive kids when they were 18 months old. And we looked at measuring this in the biological parents. And we found that biological parents, again, predicted their ca the child callous unemotional behaviors, both fearlessness and low affiliative behavior, but via child traits. So biological mother's fearlessness predicted adoptive child's fearlessness, which in turn predicted their CU behaviors. But again, parenting still buffers this pathway. So that black line that you see that looks very significant is that fearless temperament in the child predicts callous and emotional behaviors. So not good. If your kid is fearless, they're much more likely to have these callous and emotional behaviors uh, a year or two later. But if the parent is really warm, that solid blue line, they knock out that risk. So again, even kids who look risky early on because they're fearless, really warm parenting can make a difference. So we think that CU behaviors and traits come from interaction between genetic risk and experience. And they might be early traits like fearlessness and impulsivity and lack of empathy and reward sensitivity. But we think they interact with parenting. They probably other contexts as well as things like maltreatment in dangerous neighborhoods. That's research that we're trying to do now. Um, I will say that though this should be a bright spot for intervention because it means if we can change parenting, that should help. Remember that in most families, not adoptive families, the parents do share genes. So if the kids are higher in callous emotional traits, there's, a, there's more of a chance the parents also have those traits, which means they might not be as engaged with you as a treatment provider. So we've made this kind of model of the development of CU behaviors where these kids are born or inherit lower emotional sensitivity to others and higher fearlessness that interacts with low warmth and higher parental harshness, which increases the risk for CU behaviors and in turn uh, increases the risk for violence and low empathy over time. But then people say, well, are you just blaming the parent by doing all this research? Are you just showing it's the parent's fault? No. These kids are harder to parent. So in the same adoptive, uh, adoptive sample, a uh, study led by Chris Trenacosta, who's faculty at Wayne State, we showed again that there are evocative effects. Harsh parenting does predict development of CU behaviors, but again, CU behaviors evoked harsher parenting in this adoptive sample. So these kids are harder to parent. I'm sure that for any of us, it would be more difficult. We might be harsher ourselves. The other thing I always note is that uh, sometimes undergrads, when I present this, will say, why are these parents so mean? So we did a study where we showed that maternal warmth as early as age two predicted CU traits at 10 or 12, which in turn predicted CU traits at age 20. But what we found is that um, a bunch of factors from a model that Jay Belsky described as determinants of parenting predicted that maternal warmth. So it was things like low maternal age, aggressive personality or low empathy, uh, neighborhood impoverishment, child difficult temperament, and maternal depression. So these parents aren't mean. These are young parents. These are single parents. These are parents without a lot of resources, parents who may not have a lot of skills themselves with emotion regulation, who might have more risky genes themselves. And this goes into kind of a broader family stress model, um, work from a guy named Rand Conger in Iowa, but uh, contributed by people like Bonnie McLeod at the University of Michigan, showing essentially that one way in which kids are at increased risk for mental health disorders is by the economic pressure faced by families which make them more likely to be stressed, more likely to be depressed, and then undermines their parenting. So that, that is, a lot of this variation is parenting is not about being a bad parent. It's about being a parent who's juggling a lot of things while trying to parent a kid who might be difficult. So just to wrap up, we think CU traits are a risk factor for serious antisocial behavior and psychopathy. We think CU behaviors are a risk factor for CU traits. We think we can identify CU behaviors pretty early. We don't have like an established, we don't have a measure that I would ever use in a legal system though. We think it does predict worse outcomes, but it could be a thing, good thing to target in interventions. And we think it, that CU behaviors appear via heritable factors like fearlessness, but also via experiences like parenting. 
If you want to learn more about this work, we have two different papers where we summarize a lot of it. One is in child development perspectives, um, and one is in current opinions in psychology. That's where the uh, figure I had, so I know I went through the figure fast. If you're interested in that, you can check that out again. A lot of this work was led by uh, Becky Waller. And if you're concerned about a child, uh, I recommend seeking out a licensed psychologist who specializes in treatment for families and children. I'm a licensed psychologist, but unfortunately right now I don't do treatment. We don't have infrastructure in my lab right now to be doing intervention studies. So sometimes parents contact me and I have to say, there's nothing I can do for you personally. But most uh, child therapists will have experience uh, with early behavior problems. They can help evaluate and give recommendations. Again, caution with diagnosing kids yourself. And we do know that there are treatments that work. So the brand names of some of these treatments include things like parent management training. Uh, one of the brand name packages that is called the Incredible Years, which a lot of schools use. Parent-child interaction training is pretty cool. They put like an ear bug in your ear, and a therapist sits behind a one-way mirror and gives you instructions while you're playing with your kid. Um, functional family therapy has also been shown to be effective. And there are summer treatment programs across the country that treat kids with early behavior problems. And there's one at Florida International University that's been doing a lot of research on treating kids with callous and emotional traits. In adolescence, we also know that something called multisystemic therapy is effective for adolescents. And in fact, in some states, they've used that as an um, alternative to incarceration, and it's really effective. Um, these interventions work by trying to break this coercive cycle, um, help intervene with parents, both to change parenting behaviors, but also because parents spend all the time with the kids. An hour a week with a therapist is not going to do a lot, so you want to work with parents to help them sculpt the behavior and do things like increase positive relationships with the kids using praise um, and more child-directed praise, and only sparingly use things like um, discipline and timeout. So uh, I want to just thank uh, a lot of the contributors. So a lot of that uh, data that I described came from uh, Danny Schott, the University of Pittsburgh, collaboration with Alex Burt, Leslie Levin, Janae Niederheiser. Uh, a lot of this work was led by Becky Waller. Um, these projects have been funded by the National Institute of Health and a bunch of other um, foundations across decades, so I've been really fortunate to be able to work with a lot of this data. Uh, a lot of things go to my lab. It takes a big army of, uh, of uh, grad students, undergrads, uh, research staff to do a lot of this work. Um, and thank you all for coming out on this rainy night, and I'm happy to answer questions. Any thoughts about how to get this information across preschools across the country? Uh, that's a good question. So um, a, a woman named Lori Washlog, who's actually sisters of Ari from uh, Zingerman's, uh, is doing a lot of work in Chicago um, with something called DB Map. So she's trying to essentially make a really good um, early childhood questionnaire that will help identify things like callousness and behavior problems in a better way than some of the existing ones. And with the goal of the idea that we could actually use these, standardize them, they're in the process of doing that. So you can actually give scores to teachers and, and, and parents to say, like, this kid is not in danger, this kid is in danger, and help inform those kind of um, things. I don't think they're done yet, but I think that's the long term, and to use it in pediatric primary care, because a lot of pediatricians, this is not going to be their main focus. Um, so that's the goal. Our scales have been mostly been ad hoc, like from other things existing, so it's not like we've developed one for this purpose. I think that Laura Washlock has done a better job with that than we have, and so I think that will be the next best step, although we've been tempted to try to measure some of these and get a good measure we could get out so that people could actually get feedback on that. The intervention I talked about, the Early Steps Project, one of the big components of that is you work with parents and you give them feedback. Your kid's doing, you gave, you gave us all this information, your kid's doing great on this, your kid's not doing great on this. Here's how they stand compared to 100 other kids. You should be worried about this or you shouldn't be worried. So that's in the works, but, um, uh, maybe I don't have a good concrete answer for kind of preschools in the area. Uh, what about, I have a couple of questions. One, what about gender differences? You haven't said anything about that. Yeah. And what do the gender differences say about the nature of the phenomena, if anything? Yeah. So aggression is a male phenomenon for the most part. Uh, males are more aggressive at all ages. Uh, most kids hide in antisocial behavior are boys and, and men. Uh, that's actually been, girls' antisocial behavior, unfortunately, has actually been increasing in adolescence in the last couple decades, but it's still much lower. Um, but while most of the people we're talking about here are boys, in any of the samples that we have that contain girls, there are no differences in the etiology or causes. That is, a girl who's high in callousness probably came from the same places as a boy, they're just less, they're less likely to have girls that are high in callousness. Does that make sense? So there are mean differences, but there don't seem to be any kind of process differences or developmental differences in, in what happens. 
Another question that I have is about premature, the, the danger of premature labeling of children. Mm -hmm. And uh, that must complicate the work that you're doing. Yeah, so um, prematurity and other birth complications are certainly risk factors for a host of outcomes. In the adoption study, we actually control for those because we don't want that to be the, the cause, especially if, say, a parent's any social, the birth parent is smokes more, they're more likely to have a premature baby, and that's what's actually causing this. Um, uh, but yes, it can lead to a lot of things like language delays that can get in the way uh, of this, and certainly can be a risk factor. There are actually a lot of perinatal risk factors that are not good for kids, but through pretty rigorous studies have shown to not necessarily predict any social behavior, like smoking, for example. Oh, premature labeling. Sorry, I thought you said premature labor. Sorry, okay. <laughs> totally different answer. Um, yes, so that's, that's our biggest fear, I think, with doing this work. When we first did the, the very first paper on this, we were really scared about it. Uh, in fact, whenever we do some of this work that we think is really cool, sometimes we want to do a press release, and I get nervous about that. Um, as you can tell, when I gave the talk, I try to be really careful about what we think this does and doesn't mean. But certainly when we have done some of this work, even if we don't do a press release, people have picked it up. If you Google my name, you'll find stuff about child psychopaths. Um, I'm very worried about that. Um, that's why we try to talk about it as a risk factor. Um, on the other hand, um, the, a woman, Essie Veeding, in this field, who's a really big person in this field, has said, yes, that is a problem. But instead of not treating, identifying kids early to help them and to help society, we shouldn't not do that because we're worried about labeling. Instead, we should work with people to stop thinking about what the labels mean. Um, and there's been you know, good work in stuff like substance abuse, for example. People have started seeing that substance abuse is not necessarily like a, a weakness in wills, but is a brain disorder, things like that. So I think, I think the more important thing is to use the science to help kids if we can, but also as we go, be pushing back against the stigma that could be associated with it or the idea of labeling. And again, to emphasize at every step that most kids identified with are going to get better on their own. Does that answer that correct question this time? Yes, okay. Yeah. I have two questions I'll just tell you both. One is, I wonder to what extent um, societal norms impact the definitions, and then that goes all the way back to how everything else you're doing. For example, in medieval times, if a kid you know, bashes in the head of his companion, so that'd be great, because he's going to be a great warrior. Mm -hmm. And in modern times, that's not the case. So to what extent do definitions influence on this? And should I just go ahead? Sure. So I mean, it's, I, all of these things are social constructs. I'm sure they change over time. But I think the, the best uh, example of that is the idea that, well, would a psychopath be great in the military? Because they might be a really efficient killer. There's really good, or a good uh, firefighter, because they'll be fearless. There's not great work, but there's some showing that they're actually really bad because they're not team players. And for even military things, you know, he might be a great warrior if he bashes his head in, but then he goes and bashes his, the other guy that's, that he's fighting with his head in. And so that's actually not helpful. So yes and no, I had some, we, in fact, we put something in an early manuscript and a reviewer luckily said, actually there's science on this and it shows that no, these traits are bad generally. Um, and they, because they interfere with interpersonal relationships and those are pretty necessary to do most things. Okay. And my second unrelated question is, I wonder, I missed this in your work and it might already be there, to what extent do you see where uh, kids that don't have CU indicators, but then because of the environment, you know, there's a lack of warmth, there's danger in the neighborhood, it, it, that environment turns them into you know, what you would call mm -hmm. psychopathy or what have you, because it's a coping mechanism mm -hmm. to survive. Yeah, so there, there's some research on um, uh, what one scholar called um, uh, what was it like? Um, normalization of antisocial behavior. There's a, there's a couple of ones. We've, I've actually done some some work earlier on that about how the context may help us morally disengage, that we feel better about doing bad things because this is going to help us survive. There's not good work. Um, I'd be interested, for example, in gang initiations where it takes kids who are not don't otherwise look particularly high in psychopathy. Um, there's just not good work on that. I think it's possible. On the other hand, we, we you don't see when you look at adult psychopaths, you don't see many people who didn't start really, really early. So that is, maybe people will look psychopathic transiently or be high in these traits from a measurement perspective, but you don't have that stability into adulthood unless you had it really early on. Which is part of the reason I think a lot of people think this is kind of, you know, nature, 
continuously because you don't see a lot of people starting in adolescence. Yeah, yeah there's these uh, findings of yours, I mean, they're obviously based on American families mm -hmm. and culture. Do they hold up cross-culturally? I mean, are Asian cultures all these same? Yeah, so they use the psychopathy checklist in like 50 or 60 countries and are shown that at least the factor structure of it, that is how the items work together, seem to hold cross-culturally. But even some really basic findings in America don't always hold up. So there are some really good examples where um, a lot of work on sort of basic things that we think are definitely true about psychopathy, like this fear deficit, was actually done mostly on, on uh, white or European American prisoners. When they've done it with black or African American prisoners, it doesn't replicate. So. Um, I would say the general idea is that we think it does go across m many cultures, but I think there's a lot more work to be done, and most of it has been done in the U.S., Canada, and Europe. So most of these kind of Western and um, whitish um, it's much cultures. Much more individualistic, as yeah. opposed to yeah. But there is some work showing that it does. It, yeah, that it does work in other cultures that you might not expect it to. But I think there's a lot more work to be done there. This is really interesting, especially coming from somebody who. Uh, never formally studied psychology. I've studied other topics, but not psychology. Um, I have two questions, well, probably more, but two that I can think of now. <clears throat> One is um, the study you did about, you know, where the adoptive parents intervene and they can kind of stave off a lot of the manifestations of, of predetermination or symptoms. Um, you mentioned the adoptive mother. What about the role of the father? Yeah. Um, I'm not to, not to sound heterosexist, but you know, a one parent family versus a two parent family. Yeah. Um, secondly, um, you had mentioned in, at the beginning of the of, of your lecture um, signs of psychopathy, such as sexual aggressiveness. You know, um, I was an immigrant child, first generation immigrant, and both I and my parents were very um, not only concerned but really frightened by the level of sexual aggressiveness that you know, my peers showed at very young ages, mm -hmm. you know, back in the 70s and 80s, and, mm -hmm. you know, even as early as early grade school, and that when teachers tried to intervene, parents, first of all, there are two parts to that question. How cooperative are parents these days in terms of showing concern or reacting to the concern of, 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 of educators, first of all? And secondly, are you doing more studies about levels of sexual aggression in younger and younger kids be, and, and, you know, how does that lead to uh, sexual aggression and sexual, you know, predator behavior later on? All right, let me see if I can remember all of them. So the first thing is, what about dads? So I'm a dad, um, I would like to study dads more. Or a um, parent. Or a second parent. So in, in a lot of our kind of lower income families, they're often a, a grandparent or a cousin or a, a, um, a sister or a boyfriend, whoever it is. Um, when we have studies, when we have samples that have dads, we always look at the dads. The adoption study, um, the biological dads, we don't have, we have less than a quarter or a half. So we just couldn't look at that. In fact, there's another study showing that the dad's genetic inheritance might be slightly more important than the mom's. We would have liked to look at that. Um, in, in the work we did, um, the findings do hold up if we look at the alternate caregiver, which in most adoptive parents is a two-family parent. Adoptive parents are not a uh, random selection. They tend to be more well-educated, have more money, and more often be two-parent families. Um, uh, and we find basically the same results, but they're not as strong, and it's a little more heterogeneous group. So when we have those, we do look, and fathers seem to have similar effects, but I think we haven't been able to study it as well as we'd like to because we often don't have a second parent. Um, in the studies that we do now, we try to get a second parent in as often as we can to, to answer questionnaires. Um, in terms of uh, early levels of sexual behavior, um, most of the measures that we use are normed within a culture, and so you're really looking at that relative to other people in the culture. And so if it's a higher mean level in one culture, you're looking at how extreme they are compared to the average level. And so that average level could differ across cultures. Um, so um, in that sense, we're looking at how, they, how kids differ from norms in this culture when, when the measures were normed. Um, as far as whether kids are getting um, more sexually aggressive in this country, I don't know. I don't know that literature. Um, I don't know if that exists. Uh, we're not doing work on it. Um, it's not, not of interest to us. It's just not something that we've done in most of our studies right now are with adolescents because we're also really interested in how early experience affects the brain and it's hard for us to do brain scans with kids under eight or 10. Um, 
So it's not something we're studying or that I can tell you anything about as an expert, um, but there might be cross-cultural studies out there comparing that. And one last question at the back. Um, is there any, any studies or uh, work on um, the idea of, let's say, split, a split self or repressed uh, rage, uh, perhaps related to unmet narcissistic needs as an infant and young child, and leading to the development of acting out aggressive behavior later on in all the other uh, sociopathic kind of um, um, traits. Are you, I'm, I'm thinking of Kohut and self Yeah, so I may be the wrong person to ask. So um, a lot of those theories um, are, I think, very intriguing theories. There's not a lot of empirical support for them. Um, I would say in general that um, even the disorder, um, dissociative identity disorder, is a um, hotly debated disorder about whether it exists or not, and there's a lot of science showing that it probably doesn't exist, or if it does, it's created by therapists. Um, so it's difficult. Uh, it, that, I think that would be a difficult thing to measure because it has to do with a lot of um, kind of um, reading into the motivations for the behavior. We certainly do think that uh, the attachment between the parent and the child does matter, and when we measure warmth, part of what we're measuring is the positive relationship that kids have, which would be called by in people in other circles attachment. Um, so we do think that's important, um, but um, in terms of like the idea of interpsychic forces against each other, I, I just I don't think there's a lot of empirical support for that, and I don't think there's anyone in the field studying that. Just one more follow-up. Um, yeah. When you were talking about warmth as a parenting factor, mm -hmm. is that including um, <clears throat> empathic uh, mirroring by the parent, uh, or how, how is the warmth defined? What are all the, the things that are going into warmth? It depends on the construct, and it's been different in different of our studies, but um, it often has to do with observations of positive reinforcement, so good job, um, uh, um, sharing things like uh, using diminutive or endearing terms for the kid, a pat on the back, a hug. Um, it could, in a really hard one, um, you would probably get rated higher in warmth if you're saying, like, I understand that's really hard for you or you're really upset about that. Um, so it could be included in that, and I would say that our, um, the way that we operationalize warmth fits across different traditions, so I'm somebody who's fairly behavioral, and I think these are behavioral principles of positive reinforcement, but it also has to do with the relationship, and so people who are interested in attachment might also see this as kind of a positive attachment. I think any of those, any of those I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think that the better the parent and child get along, the more warmth there is, the more positive reinforcement, the better the kid's doing, and you can explain that in, I think, multiple different ways. All right, so I, I, I did way too many slides, so I went a little over, so I think we're out of time. Thank you for coming. I'm happy to answer more questions up here as you leave. This program was recorded on September 24th, 2018 at the Ann Arbor District Library.